Oh, let's do this thing. I think we're doing the thing. Welcome back, everybody. I, I still feel like I'm in recovering from conference mode, so I apologize if I'm a little bit weird in the stream, but uh, yeah, it's nice to be back. And hi, everybody. Yeah, it's nice to be back. Thanks for the warm welcome. Here we are. I've got so many good t-shirts from uh, Besides Portland. So uh, you've also got to see this pretty awesome badge. They've each got a little OLED screen. The wagon wheels are actually laser cut wood that's been glued onto these little direction pads. So it's got, it's got a little game pad. I don't think this mode is interactive, but you can select between a couple of different modes. There's like this little built-in game. I think mostly the point of this is to hack it rather than for it to have a bunch of like stellar or AAA content built in though. So it's definitely a pretty hackable little platform that I am excited to play around with some more. It runs off a coin cell and a little NRF52 module here. And yeah, SWD port up there and a UART with an Arduino bootloader. And um, I was also lucky enough to uh, end up with one of these also from uh, Rob. So this is called the Oxvox. And whereas this is kind of a covered wagon, this is the Oxen <laughs> that goes with it. And the idea is this kind of goes on in place of the D-pads and gives you eight buttons. And then there's actually a speaker and a small amplifier on here so that it can do, do tones as a little synthesizer. So this could be pretty fun. Um, the way Rob assembled this is he's, I think he took off these wheels or maybe just put these on top and then reused a bunch of the same GPIOs for these buttons. I think it might be kind of neat to have a way of using this in addition to the D-pad wheels though, if that's possible. So I might think about ways to modify this further. And this is the little amplifier circuit. I think it's a class AB amp, but I haven't looked at the chip in detail. Um, and yeah, Robert asks if it has multiplayer features. You know, I'm not sure. Um, when I was talking to, oh, I forget, I keep forgetting his real name, but uh, uh, Root Killer, who actually designed this version of the badge, um, he and I were talking in the hallway and uh, he mentioned that it had some Bluetooth features, but I, I didn't actually see it advertising on my phone, so I'm not quite sure how to trigger that, so. Um, no obvious multiplayer features, but I'm not sure what kind of stuff might be hidden there. We might try to find the, uh, the GitHub repo with the code for this on the stream, though. So yeah, that's been, that's been fun. Uh, I, I find conferences just super exhausting, and it's been a while since I've done one. Because, um, you know, the, the way they usually go is I go, and it's super stressful, and... I just have, you know, somewhere between 0.5 and three mental health crises on the trip, and then just somehow manage to pull together the thing that I'm actually supposed to be doing, like the workshop or the talk, and and it actually went really well. I think the talk was really well received. Um, I was meaning to post the slides, but I haven't actually just posted them because the file is so huge, so I thought the thing I might do in the interim is just go through them here. Oh, Steven in YouTube chat says, have a good day. Well, thank you. I will try to. I encourage everyone else to try as well. All right. Yeah, well, maybe that's a good time to just look at the, I can show you a bit of the content I was trying to present there. There is going to be a video, I think. Most of the talks were recorded, um, but you know, it's gonna take time for them to process the videos and stuff, so. I thought it would be nice to uh, start with just showing you the slides. Um, of course, the way I'm doing this is just plugging the laptop into the auxiliary input here. And then having no idea where the mouse is. There we go. Oh, Adler says they're happy I'm back. I feel the same way, thank you. Oh, and it's so nice to be back here with Tuco. I was just trying to get Tuco on camera, but he's over here on the floor with me now. 
Maybe I can find him without putting my laptop to sleep. <laughs> Anything else in this bag that we need to show? Ah, uh, there's some like work in progress stuff. Maybe some stuff I'll show later, but. Uh, let's put this out of the way. <laughs> I think Tuco just wants to investigate all the different smells on that bag that I was traveling with. Oh yeah, I, I should mention that we got a chance to do some really good hanging out there. Um, spend some good time with Kate and Chris and uh, Piotr. Piotr. I, I feel like I've, I've now seen like three completely different ways of pronouncing his name and my brain is going to get confused about which one I'm going to try to go for, but we'll see what happens. Oh, Philippe asks, how do you change between the games and the badge? I think the idea is you press both of the buttons at the same time. Let me see if I can demo that. So it has a little on off switch up here. Um, so if you just power it on, it actually gives you the Adafruit logo really quickly because I think that's the graphics driver. And then it's a little fiddly, but I think if you press these both at the same time and get lucky, it switches modes. And I think it just cycles between these three. There's like the little shooting the camera kind of mode. And then there's the B-Size PDX logo. And this one, it's not really obvious at first, but it actually has a lot of different glitch things that it goes through. It's pretty neat. <laughs> Can we get a closer view of the OLED? <laughs> Polish Peter. Yeah, I'm actually kind of curious about the code for this, because when I saw this, I was like, oh man, those clouds, how are they being generated? Is that, because if I was making this, I would be tempted to have the clouds actually spell out the bit pattern of the whole flash memory in some way. Like you could read out the source, the, uh, the binary code through the clouds if you wanted. I wonder if we can find that. Hmm, I'm just gonna do a really quick, Search here on GitHub. Oh yeah, here it is. It's on Joe Fitz's uh, is, uh, GitHub. <laughs> PDX trail. Uh, it might not actually be checked in yet. Uh, is there any other branches or no, there's just one commit. Okay, maybe this is where it's going to be. <laughs> maybe it's not actually checked in yet. Or maybe it's on, um... oh, I wonder if, I wonder if, I, I, I don't remember his name. I'm sorry, but the, uh, the other designer, Root Killer. I wonder if that's the same GitHub account. Yeah, I don't know. Oh, maybe. That looks like the hardware design. <laughs> that looks like last year's firmware. What is this one? Oh, do we lose video here? Sorry. This is what I get for having the longest HDMI cable. This is looking promising. Oh, is this for the Bender badge? That looks familiar. Oh man, my signal integrity here is suffering. I should have chosen a different cable, I think. <laughs> okay, so maybe it's just a bitmap that got uh, dithered. 
I'm surprised these source images are color. I wonder what the conversion tool, or if there's a conversion tool is doing. Duco, what are you doing? Okay. So these are the actual sprites. They just converted them offline. Cool. Okay, well that's probably the starting point when we get to that. Um, anyway. Can I get Tuco on frame here? <laughs> Tuco, that was meta. Oh, such a good cat. Yeah, I really miss this guy. I had a couple of friends staying here, hanging out with Tuco and working in my shop, and that was nice. And Got a chance to hang out with my friend last night. Oh, I was just realizing I've still got some leftover pizza. Amazing. Anyway. Uh, so I mentioned I was going to go through the slides really quick. Um, I, I don't want to like give my talk all over again because I don't know if I could actually do that, and there's probably going to be a video anyway, but I thought I'd at least try to share the slides and share kind of the gist of what I was going for. Um, a lot of these have speaker notes. I didn't, I kind of ran into time for speaker notes near the end, so some of these I just kind of figured I'd probably know what to say. And then the thing usually happens where I actually put a lot of time into like outlining and speaker notes and that kind of stuff, but then when I'm actually giving the talk, I usually don't have the attention to actually read this stuff. So I want to have it on the screen to refer to, but then I just get carried away. Um, but yeah, anyway, the basic idea behind this was it's about... Um, oh, the slides are going to be cut off if I use this mode, isn't it? Maybe we do that. Yeah, I don't know. This is probably fine. Or even, or even that, maybe. I don't know. The problem with this mode is that a lot of these have videos which don't play. Anyway. Maybe I will just resize this. <laughs> Let's just edit it live. Reconfiguring OBS. This is not optimal. Oh well, that'll do. Hey Tuco, you keep getting off frame, dude. Now he's like under my chair. Yeah, OBS configuration con. Um, and Cat really wants to play con. Anyway, yeah, so I tried to make this talk about reverse engineering and basically I was getting, um, you know, I was noticing that a lot of people seem to, like, part of what they were getting out of watching the streams and, like, watching some of the longer format stuff that I've been putting out is just, like, more of a sense of how many steps there are and just how a lot of this is um, just kind of way more detailed than maybe the popular conceptions of the same work would, would have you believe. Oh, Tuco actually has been giving me a bolt. Okay, Tuco, I'm just dense here. Where do you want me to throw this? Is that a bad throw? <laughs> Maybe he'll be busy with that. Oh, David asks, does Tuco travel with you for cons? Um, I have not tried that so far. I don't think Tuco would like that very much. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe... I don't know, I could see maybe like getting Tuco registered as an emotional support animal because he probably would qualify and then maybe it would be easier to travel with him. Um, I don't know. 
I, I don't really want to put him through that, though, because I don't think he would like it. Me too, girl. You found it. You're so good at this. Oh, yeah. So anyway, I was just trying to kind of dig deeper into this idea that this stuff that I'm, that I like doing the reverse engineering, like a lot of it is just about putting a lot of time into something and then getting out this semi-reliable, detailed slice of information about what's going on inside. And, you know, when I say semi-reliable, you know, all, all the time you find stuff out by reverse engineering that's like incorrect or incomplete. But what I mean is that you can, you can kind of get into something regardless of whether it's documented or whether someone wants you inside or not. And you can get an idea of how it works that's much more about how things are actually put together than how the engineers intended them to go together. And I've just found it to be a really useful thing for, you know, for learning as well as for actually, you know, doing something concrete with a particular device. And I kind of wanted to try to share that sense with people. So, you know, I was starting out by trying to kind of take this image of this, like, cool hacker. And, like, a lot of what makes this kind of hacker appealing is that it's like, well, once you've gotten to this level of, like, eliteness or whatever, then you can just, like, do anything you want. It's, like, all-powerful, whatever. But, like, even though skill clearly does have a have a have an impact here, I think that is not really accurate in terms of, you know, even when you do have a lot of skill, it takes a lot of time, and you have to kind of invest that time in a way that either teaches you something or gives you some information that maybe you can carry forward in a, in a good way. So I'm trying to, yeah, go through some, some hackers that are not really exactly what I want to be aiming toward, even if they're cool, even if they're like good TV characters. And then kind of talking more about, well, this is, this is what I mean by hacker. Like I, I grew up with the kind of open source hacker stuff and, um, and that was much more about the way you approach problems and the way you try to take things apart and figure out how they work and trying to encourage more of that. And yeah, this, like a lot of people mean different things by, by hacking. So, you know, um, and then just kind of went into what, what inspired me a long time ago. So I really liked how video games, you know, I, I could kind of get into playing video games, but when I would, um, when I could figure out kind of how to dig inside of what made them work, like the Game Genie was one of my first inspirations there because it showed me this is actually just a program running on a computer and you can get in there and change something and then, if you make some change in the very middle of this system, then you can watch how that affects everything around that change and get a sense of how the whole system's put together. So, and then I, you know, I had some good example projects. Like this was a, uh, a thing I did a while ago called the Cube 64. That was, I guess this was my first serious video game reverse engineering project. I thought it was gonna be simple because I just wanted to reverse engineer this controller protocol. There were already some people who had documented the N64 controller protocol and the GameCube controller protocol, but not well enough that you could actually successfully emulate an N64 controller. So this involves some extra work just to get that put together. And Robot Odyssey, I've, I've talked about this a bunch before, but this was a fun thing to reverse engineer because I could, um, I could really get into this kind of synthetic world that was made by just a couple of people and, you know, I think nowadays reverse engineering is so often applied to these extremely complicated systems that are made by many different people layered together. Um, but something like this, the parts that I took apart at least, those were made by just like one or two programmers, I think. And um, it, was, it was really nice. It, you get this sense of, um, you know, kind of almost getting inside someone's head and seeing, well, how they approach the problem. And um, this game originally used just a very, very old school keyboard input. Like it was written to support these XT keyboards that didn't even have the arrow keys. So actually trying to m navigate around um, with a modern keyboard is a little bit weird. So I, I had to binary patch it to support modern keyboards. And then I went a little further and like that bottom left, I'm moving the sprites around with the mouse. I added some code into the game's main loop that used the DOS mouse driver and then checked for collisions. And uh, um, when you drag an object, it would actually move that in the game's sprite database, which uh, seemed to work all right. And then one of these days, I'll actually make this port playable. This was a partially complete Nintendo DS port that I did of the same game. 
Oh, Robert says, didn't it support the classic HJKL navigation? Yeah, it did. And um, it also supported the, um, the numeric keypad. I think that's what it was mainly designed for, is you'd use the, like, the numbers on the numeric keypad. But it didn't support the regular arrow keys that they added in the, XT, at the AT keyboards. I think the XT that I had that I played this on, the numeric keypad had arrows, like an eight-way direction arrow kind of pad on it. And that's what this game was designed for. Yeah, it was pretty weird. Um, another reverse engineering project. This one was called the Kilowatt Clock. It was just a reverse engineering this protocol that uh, an energy monitor I had at the time was using. So it would, it had a current clamp in your breaker box that would measure the amount of power your whole house was using. Then it would actually transmit data at like 1200 baud, you know, some kind of, I think it was like, I don't think it was even FSK. I think it was just like on off keyed pulses of like a couple hundred kilohertz or something on the power line. So you can see here, like I made a receiver for it using very simple electronics. The original thing used some Philips IC that was an integrated power line modem, but I, I didn't really feel like going that route. And I, I thought I would just see if I could extract the signal myself. But I also didn't really want to like be tuning filters that were directly attached to mains. So I also gave myself the constraint of recovering the signal on the secondary side of a, uh, a wall wart like plug-in AC transformer. So this was a nine volt AC input that was providing both power for the the little AT tiny there, and I was slurping off the data using a little filter in the op amp circuit. Mm -hmm. go. <laughs> I'm not really sure where this is going. <laughs> oh, you wanna go that way? Now he's on the chair, okay. <laughs> yeah. I also just had to show off the Visual 6502 as, like, because I was kind of on the topic of, well, the Robot Odyssey thing was, this is something where it's kind of rare, but you get to reverse engineer, like, basically all of the Lego blocks that the original engineers put together to build this thing. You're just tearing them all apart to about the same level of detail, which was, is very satisfying. Um, and then this is, it's, it's a rare thing, because usually you're just reverse engineering along kind of one narrow path. But this was a good example I could think of, of just something else where you're just taking this whole design and reversing it. So this was done based on reversing a 6502 die down to individual layer scans, and then annotating those with actual polygons, which can then be uh, run through a simulator, so all the actual wires and transistors are being simulated in JavaScript to, uh, to run code. <laughs> like uh, Chris says, there's something satisfying uh, about a pin labeled clock connected to a clock movement. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's a good, uh, a good quote from um, Mako MK who says, uh, that reminds me, I think it was Penn or Teller's description of magic. Uh, and the quote is, sometimes magic is just someone spending more time on something than anyone else might reasonably expect. That is very true. I like that a lot. So yeah, then I was kind of starting to bring in this metaphor of, well, kind of abstractions building on abstractions. And we can, we can get familiar with these blocks and get used to sticking them together. But usually that the kind of engineering you do when you build a prototype or a product or an HDMI cable that's way too long, sorry, um, is kind of getting to know these blocks pretty well and then just sticking them together. Um, geez, sorry my screen is flickering so much. And then, and then, the, and then I was kind of making fun of block diagrams because you, you get used to building these things out of these very well-defined blocks. But then the, the diagrams you put together to explain what you end up with as a result of this process, they're just full of lies. Like, um, oh man, these are so bad. Like, do you think, for example, that those device drivers are, are like kind of poking completely up through the kernel and the, the application code now has a way of talking to the device drivers without going through the kernel at all? Like, what does that even mean? This is entirely fiction. Um, I don't know, and then hardware diagrams, 
tend to be maybe slightly more based in reality because they tend to, there's often a physical thing that you manufacture that you're describing, but in the more complex areas of hardware, like system on chip designs, like you end up with the same kinds of runaway complexity and difficult uh, to document designs as you do with software. Hey Tuco, what are you doing Tuco? Yeah, man, I think I, I think I was using this slide to talk about the kind of comfortable world where you've got all these Lego blocks you like and you can just design anything you want. Um, I like this photo though. I actually took this photo um, in a Lego model my ex made a long time ago. He really likes Legos and he made this whole little Lego city with a bunch of his friends in it. And so this was actually his Lego version of me at my desk working. <laughs> <laughs> and then I did a bunch of macro photography inside his model. Um, yeah, and then I was starting to just talk about how these, um, you start to rely on these, these floors of abstraction where you think you have something solid to stand on. So either the features in your language or the, uh, you know, the processor instruction set or whatever. And these are always fake. Like you, you need something like that in order to develop products and prototype things. But you're always relying on something that's not exactly reliable. And so when you discover a hole in that abstraction floor, that's another place where you kind of have to use reverse engineering a lot of the time. And, uh, and yeah, that happened to me a lot when I was working at VMware designing these really complicated software layers that would have to go in between black boxes. So you have this black box application, like say Portal, and this black box GPU and GPU driver. And then in between those, you have to stick something that virtualizes the GPU. And when anything goes wrong, you inevitably end up having to reverse engineer what the two black boxes were trying to do at the time when the bad thing happened. So yeah, and then, and then I was just kind of driving that point even farther, saying like, yeah, sometimes these floors just completely burst out from under you and you end up with problems like Rowhammer where there's this small detail about how the actual DRAM refresh doesn't always work sufficiently. And then that can just tunnel all the way up into JavaScript and cause huge gaping security problems. Um, and I didn't even really get to talking about this in the actual talk, but that bottom image was supposed to be a kind of stand in for power analysis, kind of having a similar effect of breaking through your abstraction floor. Hey Tuco, what are you doing? I think that's a terminal block. Um, yeah, and I really like this metaphor of reverse engineering as this, like a chisel, because it's something that you can kind of stick anywhere there's a little bit of a crack and just spend a lot of time with it and then end up with this, uh, this larger crack or maybe uh, you know, some wood shavings that you can use to understand what, what's actually going on inside there. Um, I don't know if anybody else enjoyed the debug log, but, uh, <laughs> and then, um, and then, yeah, I was, and then I was kind of going into, well, this is a tool for splitting interfaces, but sometimes the trouble is just figuring out which interfaces you even want to go after. So my example for that was this Nintendo DSi reversing I did a while ago. Um, so you take this thing apart and I mean, for a little bit of context, it's, it's a platform that Nintendo released after the original Nintendo DS. Um, the, the original Nintendo DS was basically just a Game Boy Advance with a better GPU and a second processor, um, which is a bit reductive. Like, it, it was, it's a nice piece of kit. It's a fun platform to program for. And I'd been having fun doing homebrew stuff for the DS, like you might guess from that Robot Odyssey thing. But when the DSi came out, I wanted to help out with the homebrew effort on that, to get the same level of access for just doing your own programs for the platform. And it seemed even more promising because there's more RAM, there's a built-in SD card slot, but all of that extra hardware was locked away by default. Um, you had to put the processor into a different operating mode to use it, and normally that operating mode was only accessible if your cartridge had an additional cryptographic signature. So they were introducing this chain of trust, and you could opt out of the chain of trust, but only if you were using the older hardware mode which wasn't that interesting. So the idea was kind of how to break into that chain of trust in order to run just arbitrary code on the system. 
which is kind of a silly thing to have a security system to prevent you from doing. It's one of those things where, like, here I am, like, up against somebody else's security system, like, kind of hacking into it or whatever, but, like, I'm not trying to steal anything other than access to this hardware that I already own, so... That's, that's like one of those things where like I think this is a good cause to hack for, like helping people get more understanding and access to the hardware that's already in their lives, like their own phones, their own video games, you know, their own microcontrollers. And so it was a nice project to, to give me both some technical challenges and maybe an end goal that, that was you know, worth pursuing. I, I, sh I also, you know, kind of regret documenting this stuff, or regret not documenting it as well as I do now. Um, that's why I'm really liking the stuff that Hedgeberg's been doing recently with, like, reverse engineering Nintendo Switch stuff and streaming it on Twitch, since I wish I could have shared more of the stuff that I did, since a lot of it just ended up in a completely disorganized pile of binaries that I didn't end up sharing with very many people. So I would start out with, um, you know, kind of extending some other experiments. So like, I, there was already a well-known, um, basically just uh, a code execution vulnerability in a game. So you could, um, you could just buffer overflow a save game file in this game and get code execution. Um, it turned out not to be that interesting though because this game, even though it is signed and uses some of the new features, still has a lot of the features we cared about disabled. Specifically, it did not have access to the SD card slot, only the camera. So it was not that great. Um, we got a little bit of progress in like figuring out the camera, but um, that turned out to be a bit of a dead end. The more interesting interface turned out to be the interface between these three chips on the main board. So I tried looking at the EMMC first because that was pretty narrow. I could just attach a few wires to that and get a better idea. But the EMC, EMMC was all encrypted. Um, that didn't stop me entirely. It was still interesting to try to figure out, um, for example, um, the way they implemented the encryption, the, it was not very good. It was not very good. Um, they would generate, uh, how did this work? There's a secret key that varied per console, and then an initialization vector that varied per memory block. But then you would just take those two things and use them and an AES uh, module to generate a pad of data, which you would then XOR against the block you would be putting into the EMMC. So that XOR pad did not change depending on the contents of the block. So if you made a change to the flash memory and then wrote it and then diff the flash memory both times, um, the XOR of those two diffs, even though the diffs are both encrypted, is identical to the XOR of the plain texts. So I almost had an exploit based on that. Um, I, used, I used that technique to figure out enough of the partition table to figure out where some of the interesting areas were. And so I could figure out like, well, here's, um, well, and I could also use the access patterns so I figured out the partition tables and like where the interesting binaries were and, um, and where I could actually write to from applications. So for example, I could take photos and those photos would be written to the EMMC. So I was imagining, well, could I actually get it to get the photo taking application, you know, if I could like stream just the right data into the camera, could I get it to write that data with the right encryption key to the wrong location? and then overwrite some of the code in the bootloader, or not the bootloader necessarily, but like the main menu. So that didn't end up working, but I had fun investigating that. Um, the thing that did end up helping a lot was getting in between the SD RAM and the system on chip. Um, they kind of tried not to keep any security relevant stuff in the SD RAM even, but there were still ways that you could hijack control flow by changing stuff in SDRAM. And then once you've got control flow, it's game over. You can just stick your own code in internal RAM in the system on chip and then copy internal RAM to external RAM and then get the keys you want. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> Robert says, did you ever get in legal trouble for reverse engineering, like the vendor suing me? Uh, no, not quite. There was one close call there, but no. Um, I mean, with the Nintendo stuff, Nintendo was mostly going after pirates. Um, they did unintentionally go after some 
reverse engineers who were really not trying to help piracy. So there's always a danger with companies like that, that even if you're doing something that they shouldn't have any reason to care about, that they might still want to ruin your day anyway. And uh, I mean, it hardly even matters whether this stuff is legal, right? Like even if you have, you know, all the authority you want to reverse engineer something for interoperability, which, you know, as far as I know, and I'm not a lawyer, but that's still legal in this country as far as I know, reverse engineering for interoperability. Um, there's a bunch of stuff the DMCA interferes with, but, um, you know, Nintendo won't care. I mean, bigger companies like Sony especially won't care. Um, so yeah, in some ways you do have to kind of pick targets that, you know, aren't going to try to swallow you, but, or, or just, you know, do it anonymously so they can't, uh, they can't really ruin your day as effectively. But yeah, that is certainly a problem because, you know, Nintendo, they don't have any authority to tell you you can't run your own software on your own hardware, right? But they're still going to try to keep people from pirating their games using some methods that unintentionally end up hurting homebrewers, which is really annoying. Yeah, so that is certainly something to watch out for, is even if the thing you're doing is totally moral and even totally legal, then the companies can still ruin your day. But um, I, don't want, I don't want that to discourage people from reverse engineering. Um, that's just maybe a reason to reverse engineer stuff that isn't backed by like hundreds of lawyers. So yeah, Sony stuff can be a bit fraught. Um, I would certainly encourage people to reverse engineer Sony stuff, just maybe don't publish it under your own name. <laughs> um, this is what I got, uh, this is like the next level of this. I ended up doing a bunch of soldering, then making a big FPGA rig that could, um, this time I was just uh, passively listening for all the data going between the RAM and the system on chip and writing it out over USB so I could analyze it. And then the next step was actually getting in between the two so that I could kind of end the SDRAM's uh, packet and then kind of take over writing the rest of the packet myself. So I actually had a, a list of triggers in the FPGA where if the, if the system on chip was reading from any of those trigger addresses, then I could actually start injecting my own packets instead of letting the DRAM finish that packet. So that was actually how I, inserted code into here. This is a good example of something where you can reverse engineer these and no one's gonna care. <laughs> so the graphics tablets, like, um, I mean, the, the tablets I went into, um, this first one was just going more into like the theory of how this worked and like kind of treating it like, like doing science on a device. Like these, I felt like, um, I felt like these were like little science experiments, like, showing how the, how the wireless energy transfer and like kind of the location detection might work. And then, and then kind of taking that further into the specific device. So in this case, that left coil was generating a little impulse every so often. And then the right coil is just hooked up to the oscope and the resistor is there for damping to cause it to self resonate less. But here I'm just trying to get a sense for how that pen is actually picking up some of the magnetic energy and then re-releasing it in, uh, in that resonation that happens. So, <laughs> yeah, Peter says uh, free advert for Joe Grand. Yeah, actually Joe Grand was in the audience and so we had a fun little moment about that. Um, yeah, and it was kind of fun to talk about this, having uh, kind of a way to go through the different layers where if you look at the exterior layers, well, this is just a thing you can use with Illustrator and you don't really have to even think about what's going over the USB cable. But if you're on the computer and you're writing some software that needs to talk to the tablet, then maybe you need to know the APIs, maybe you need to know how it actually communicates over USB. So here I was talking about how it's a USB human interface device and it describes itself to the computer. Um, <laughs> water break. Yeah, um, and then this was a this was a tablet that I didn't actually take apart in this video, but the uh, the Wacom Intuos Pro, and I just had a a coil next to the pen, and you can see that there are actually bits going out, plus this 
kind of larger block of data or of waveform. And I was hypothesizing at this time that the large block was maybe like charging up the pen and giving it power to do the rest of the thing. But I think now that's actually probably how it locates the pen and the rest of it is how it gets pressure and button data. Um, but then I started to go a little deeper into this one tablet that I got really in depth with. This is the Wacom CTE450. Um, you might notice that all the rest of the slides in this talk are like excerpts from the video blogs. Um, so yeah, um, I, don't, I don't need to go like rehash all the stuff that I already made videos about necessarily, but um, mostly the rest of this talk was just kind of like plotting a little course through talking about some of these projects and like talking about how, um, how the different levels of reverse engineering in this, like looking at the circuit board and looking at the, the interfaces, like the data actually going between different points in the device, um, how those helped in different ways. Um, and then kind of getting more into how, well, it was getting to the end of what I could do just using the published documents. That little triple of points there was actually a debug port, but we didn't know how to get into the debug port. Um, you know, figuring out the schematic from the circuit board here, uh, at least enough that I could get a sense of what all the good inputs and outputs on the chip were. But then really getting into this point where actually I think I kind of need the firmware off this thing. How can I get the firmware off? And then going into the whole uh, uh, face whisperer thing where it was using the chip whisperer's side channel glitching, uh, the, the power glitching, but combining that with timing data coming from a USB interface that's kind of sending out test packets to try to grab the descriptors. And so the idea was you every time you plug in this device, the device gives you a little bit of information out of that same ROM that the program is contained in uh, in order to identify itself. And by, by setting up the experiment just right, I can give myself a timing reference that's right there where the processor is figuring out how to formulate the response to that question. And so that involves like taking off the crystal oscillator and giving it an external um, clock source and listening really closely to the power rails so that I can make sure that my stuff is lined up well with its internal processing. And then also hooking the power rails up to a big MOSFET so I can introduce a, a glitch at the right time. Um, and then this is the little add-on I made for the Chip Whisperer that actually does that. So it has a USB host. Um, <laughs> oh yeah, from the, the chat convo. Um, yeah, Portland seemed like, seems like a good place for hardware hacking. That was one of the reasons I enjoyed going there. I mean, <laughs> I still have, I, I have so much trouble traveling for conferences, and so I don't know that I'll be able to do this much, but um, this was a good one to try. I, it was still pretty hard, but I think it was a good, a good thing to uh, put the effort into. Oh, two goes on the rack. Oh, two goes on the rack. Let me fix the camera. Whoops. This is reminding me, there was a video that I took with me on this trip, which helped immensely, and I think I need to share it, all, share it with all of you. If you haven't seen this one, I'm gonna screen share it from my phone. Whoops. <laughs> I think I just told my phone to join the wrong uh, screen sharing target. Let's try that. It is so nice to be back home with Tuco. Such a good cat. Let's see.
I'm trying to make this HDMI switch work. That's not so good, is it? That's the wrong channel. Why is this remote so bad? That button on the remote might be broken. I just had to open the rack and just poke the switch manually. Oh well. This is the one I was trying to share. I don't know why the frame rate is so choppy here. Maybe, maybe I'll blame the Wi-Fi. But yeah, it's pretty good, right? I guess I need to reset the chat, sorry. There is a lot of noise outside, isn't there? I don't even have the window open right now. Oh, <laughs> oh no, great screenshot, Piotr. <laughs> oh, can I do this again? I should really just copy this file to the OBS machine and have it on a separate slide just so they can switch there anytime. I mean, streaming it from the phone is probably not the most efficient way of playing this video. <laughs> oh man, and Tuco doesn't even seem to mind my foot to like propping up his neck. It looks super weird, but it was really comfortable at the time. <laughs> I wonder if I can get the HDMI switch back to the other channel. Yeah. Maybe it's just the three button that's broken. Yeah, Robert says maybe make it into an infinite loop. I agree. I should make that little video into, into a loop and stick it in the OBS. I could do that right now if we wanted this to be OBS configuration con. <laughs> it would only take a couple minutes, but maybe I can do it elsewhere. Oh yeah. So, I mean, I know you can watch the, uh, the full Face Whisperer video if you want to see like the full story behind this, but I did have a slide that had basically the money shot here. <laughs> so that, uh, that top right trace is the, well, yeah, the top right trace is the power trace coming from the, the Chip Whisperer. So you can see it kind of has this waveform that's lined up and that's because of the timing, uh, the, the attention to detail with timing, so everything's in lockstep. And then it's just very slowly moving that trigger point across until it hits just the right location and gets lucky, because there's still a little bit of randomness. But then I think what's going on here is that it's disrupting the processor's normal ability to like write to its registers and memory at the, at the right time, or at the time where it calculates the length of the response. So then it ends up storing this length, which is just way too long. And then afterwards, it keeps running and it keeps servicing those USB interrupts and delivering more packets. But because that length got corrupted, it ends up just reading way past the end of the buffer and just returning USB packets with all of the firmware. And so that's why you see um, when it starts getting close to the right location. So here, all of those little white lines in the table say normal and then the red lines start showing up, and those have bit errors in them. You can actually see the glitches in the hex dump. And then some of them are longer. The longer ones are green. And then you can start to see the ones that are really longer, and then those are the ones that I actually just copied the firmware out of. So that was fun. Um, and then some of this stuff is a little more, uh, might be more familiar from the recent streams. It was going into the reverse engineering behind the, the gimbal and making that actually work well for our particular project. This is getting a little meta. 
So yeah, talking about the debug port and how we eventually use that to get the firmware off, sort of, by using that to get the, uh, the encryption key. But how first we were spending a lot more time just focusing on the serial protocol and um, trying to understand it that way and then accidentally breaking it that way. And getting some good graphs out of it. I had to show the video from the gimbal even though it was a little bit shaky at this point. Yeah, and then it was getting more into the actual firmware reversing. And <laughs> this clip is actually going through the path from interrupt vector table to where the code is actually processing individual packets, which always seems like the most fun part of it. Yeah. And then I was kind of trying to wrap this up with this, this idea that we, we don't need this idea that you know, all you've got to do is like learn all the right skills and then you can just like hack anything in five minutes. Like that's not really a useful idea to have in our particular hacker culture here. And it's, I think, a lot more useful to think about the kind of reverse engineering and hacking that we're doing as more like, you know, careful woodworking or like copying manuscripts or something that takes a lot of time but is also kind of, you know, worth valuing, you know, like some people might have described this kind of work as holy in some way. And I don't think we need to like tie it to any particular metaphysical tradition, but I think it is something that has some intrinsic value based on the way that it takes stuff which was not able to be understood and can put it into a form where more people can understand it. So I think it is something that, at least if you, if you approach it with this mentality that it's something that is worth sharing and it's worth like, putting time into, that, that it can be something that, is, that feeds more into the, like, the growth of shared knowledge and community rather than just having like, elite hacksaws who can hack all the things. So yeah, I like how Piotr describes it. It's a process that you can commit to and spend time on, not like a talent that you magically have. Yeah, I mean, Obviously, there are talents that go into it. There are skills that go into it. But I think the, the higher order bit here, if you will, the like most important thing is really the time and the motivation together because they reinforce each other. You know, if you, if you have the motivation, you'll spend time. If you've already invested a bunch of time into it, then maybe you'll have motivation to finish it. And those, those two things go together well. And then I had to end this with some Tuco pets. And I thought it was pretty awesome that I had this room full of hundreds of people just all wanting to pet Tuco right then. So I, I came home and I told Tuco that he's a really awesome, popular cat and that lots of people want to pet him. And I think he gets that. <laughs> well, anyway, I think that's basically it. Um, maybe just like in the actual talk, this is a good time to take some questions. Um, my plan for the rest of this stream is actually to just dive back into exactly the same thing we were doing before I left, which is working on the OBS plugin, which talks to the robot server. So at the high level here, this is my robot project that hangs out with my cat and acts as kind of a remote control uh, computer vision steerable camera for the shop. So <laughs> I just saw Dean's comment, Tuco, able to scale tall areas without breaking his damn leg. Yeah, I mean, knock on wood, gotta, gotta hope Tuco stays healthy, but he's been doing some amazing stuff with those limbs of his. Yeah. Oh man, I didn't get this on video, but I was just playing fetch with him last night and just throwing the bolt as usual. And <laughs> he jumps completely over this laundry hamper and I just couldn't believe it. It was, he probably cleared about a two and a half or three foot height just there. And it didn't even seem like he was hardly trying. <laughs> so. Ooh, Amazon is selling the 3DS XL. Oh, were we talking about, ha about getting uh, video game hardware? Oh, actually, I should mention that the, uh, the, the B-Sides PDX was at the same convention center at the same time as the, oh, what was it? The Portland Retro Gaming Expo, I think it's called. Why am I having so much problems with my video grabber right now? Sorry about that. 
Maybe it's overheating again. <laughs> Oh yeah, so I was thinking with the with the 3DS XL comment, they they had this uh, retro gaming expo there, and so a lot of people were selling consoles. I was, uh, I was feeling some heavy duty nostalgia about all the Game Boy stuff there. Um, there were some black and white Game Boys going for like between thirty and fifty dollars, and they also had some other consoles that I feel some nostalgia for. Oh man, I you. I, I kind of miss my Dreamcast. I gave my Dreamcast to somebody who really wanted one, so I think it went to a good home. But I got a Dreamcast a long time ago. Uh, not, not when they first came out, but like I got one on eBay um, in college because I needed an embedded platform with a Super H chip for like porting some stuff. But I also just thought it was super fun and got into, I mean, I, I got just like barely into reversing graphics processor related stuff on there. I think it was more interested in the idea of porting stuff that I'd already written than reversing at that point. But anyway, let's maybe switch to a video source that isn't always cutting out. So yeah. I, you might have seen this on uh, in my earlier complaints, but I, I would just post these slides, except right now the file is 15 gigabytes, so I need to come up with a way to trim these down. One way that I've done this in the past is to just export um, export still images for all the slides um, to a web page, but any of the slides that are basically videos, I'll just replace them with a YouTube embed. Um, I think I did that successfully on one of the talks I put on my portfolio site. Oh yeah, I should just put it up on here. Um, so if, if you go to misc.name slash talks, I think I had some stuff in here which is similar. Oh, some of that one's just, just a video. What did I do that wasn't just a video? This one? So these are all static. Oh, here we go. So I did put a couple of videos in here. The aspect ratio was kind of wrong. <laughs> yeah, so I might do something similar to this. Because, um, yeah, the reason the slides are so big is like. <laughs> Of course there's an entire episode of Rick and Morty in the keynote file, of course. And of course there's like master files at high bit rates for all of these episodes. So yeah, I'll have to trim that down, but then I'll try to post them because I know that's useful sometimes. Ha ha ha. Oh man. Dr. Toon says the Saturn also has a Super H, but it has a 3D polygon rendering hardware that causes spontaneous laughter when explained to engineers. That sounds fun. I'd love to hear an explanation about that. Anyway, let's uh, try. Oh, I think I need to actually plug this in slightly differently. I'm, I was stealing the same HDMI switch input that I was also using to debug the streaming machine. So just a sec. Sometimes the four input HDMI switch seems too small. Oh, that's a good question. Lena asks, does anyone know if E6000 is compatible with foam core board? I could test that here. I don't know that I have any foam core, but I have plenty of E6000. Uh, I have styrofoam. We could try putting E6000 on styrofoam and see if the solvent dissolves any.
Off-topic interlude. <laughs> Lun says, no, don't. It's too late. It's too late. You can't stop me. <laughs> See, now it's fun, because I didn't know the answer either, and this is easy for us to just test. Should I make a little well in here so we can tell if it's eating through? Maybe also stop down the camera a little bit, because otherwise we're not going to be able to see any detail. Oh yeah, I want to thank uh, Piotr from, uh, letting me, for letting me borrow his uh, pass to get into the Retro Gaming Expo. I didn't really have enough free time or energy to want to like get a full-size ticket, but they were about to close and he let me borrow his ticket for a while and that was super fun, so I appreciate that. Delicious. <laughs> oh no, where's the cap? Oh. That does seem to be reacting a little bit. Let's see if we can get a closer view. I still don't know where the cap for this is. That is pretty neat. Let's get this view also. Yeah, the effect is not amazingly dramatic, but you can kind of see there's the sunken in area under where the glue is. And it looks like those bubbles are coming from the trapped air in the styrofoam being let out. That's pretty neat. Now I've lost the cap for this. Here it is. Okay, thank you for bearing with me. I think science needed to be done. Oh yeah, Piot says they uh, really loved the Vector CRT games, like the Vectrex and some of the arcades. Yeah, I was looking for the Vectrex because uh, <laughs> I had heard the same uh, from him in person. And uh, I did not see the Vectrex, but I had a chance to play Battlezone, which was really, really cool. Um, especially after spending a bunch of my time in college working on BZ Flag, which is sort of a Battlezone inspired open source game. Yeah, look at that. I wonder if this is just going to eat all the way through and just leave a puddle on my desk. I suspect it'll reach an equilibrium. 
before that happens, but I don't know. Oh yeah, BZ flag. Glad some of you recognize it too. I don't know if I have any commits in the repo. I, I was like interested in it mostly because my roommate for a while was one of the maintainers. I'm kind of curious what BZ flag looks like these days. recognize that grass texture or any of those textures. Huh. I don't recognize that name either. Maybe this game has a new maintainer now. Like this originally came out of like some pretty old school silicon graphics folks. And it ran on really old like Irix machines and didn't have any textures. I don't remember any of these textures. This game doesn't look anything like I remember it. <laughs> I tried making, oh, I wonder if this is even still on Google. Pibeasy flag or Pibsy flag as we called it sometimes. No, I didn't mean Beasy flag actually. Wow, it's on the wiki. And they've uh, correctly identified it as abandoned. <laughs> yes, yes, I'm responsible for abandoning it. I, I wrote a mail or I wrote a little Python game engine that I wanted to try to use for re-implementing BZ flag and we made kind of a Oh no it is actually eating through. <laughs> uh sorry. Uh, yeah. Okay, yeah, that's make, that's gonna make a mess. <laughs> Let's put a Kim wipe under there at least. Ah, the focus knob on my microscope is getting really loose. It's like there's no way to actually tighten it enough. This is annoying. Oh, maybe I just had to turn it the other direction. Cool. I know how to use screws, honest. Wow. Yeah, thanks for the uh, proposed experiment, Len. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know if I'd say they ruined BZ Flag without having, you know, played it in a while, but yeah, it certainly looks different than I remember it. I just wanted to see if I could find some older screenshots or some screenshots of our uh, Pi BZ Flag offshoot. But now I have Styrofoam to try to get into focus. Wow, that is doing a great job at dissolving styrofoam. <laughs> yeah, Piotr says, no, I'm not. I'm just joking. It's a thing people say that have nostalgic feelings toward a game. Yeah, I understand that nostalgic feeling though. <laughs> um, let's go back to this. more like what I remember, but the textures are still not great. What was it without textures? Oops. Do we have no Pibeasy flag screenshots? This is... Oh, 
What? Why do I care? Yeah. Pi BZ Vlag might have been just completely lost to the uh, the bit bucket. Oh yeah, I remember a bunch of us were also just having fun making tools that would read and write the map format. Because it was a super simple file format that basically just made the whole world out of boxes. <laughs> and, and then the game client didn't even have to have like a real world database the way most games do. It just has like a list of boxes that all just get dumped to OpenGL in every frame. I mean, I think there might have been a little bit of frustum culling, like not rendering stuff that isn't completely on screen, but... It was really, really not designed for modern GPUs at all. Like, it was designed assuming that, um, like, immediate mode is still a good idea, basically. Anyway, enough of that. Hmm. Is there like a history of BZ flag timeline? <laughs> That's not quite what I wanted, sorry. Somebody's phone is dinging and it's not mine. Yeah, anyway. Oh, Bitbucket. All right, well, let's see if we can compile anything. So I think that's where we were getting stuck on the last stream is I was just unable to get OBS to compile. And I think it turned out that the computer had pending Windows updates. And so I think something was actually not installed completely with the Windows 8.1 kit. So I'm gonna see if we can get any further with that. Oh, oh but first, look at that. I think we can say E6000 very, very dissolves styrofoam. And I know the original question was about foam core board. So that's still kind of an open question, but I'd say it seems likely. That's a nice pattern though. I wanted to give that a little full screen time. You know, that's also interesting that it's effectively stretching out the E6000 into a thin membrane as it dries because the hole is expanding. I wonder if you could do anything interesting with that, like making lenses or windows or anything. Yeah, right. Uh, Piotr says that this pattern is something I can imagine having in the slideshow on the OBS stream. Yeah, right. This, especially if I could turn it into a Scanlime logo somehow. Maybe silkscreen OBS or silkscreen uh, Scanlime, a Scanlime in E6000 onto, <laughs> onto this material. Man, that little thin window of E6000 is so cool. It's definitely kind of a lens. <laughs> yeah, okay. Hard to get all of this in focus, but maybe some focus stacking. Actually, last time I did some really arty macro stuff like this, I put a pinhole baffle in my camera <laughs> So I used a lens extension tube and then put a piece of foil in there, like black painted foil with just a single hole in it. Hmm. Ah, Corey says, I reckon once the solvent evaporates, it'll vanish, sadly. Yeah, well, I guess we'll see. It certainly might pop, but we might end up just having a nice little plasticky window here. 
I also would expect that some of the polymer from the styrofoam is dissolving in there and maybe making it a little more viscous. But usually E6000 is pretty viscous when it dries. Hmm. Yeah. All right. Oh, so we are back in OBS Studio. That's right, I was having trouble even getting the CMake stuff to build bef or to generate before, so I'm gonna clear out this build directory and try starting from scratch, pretty much. Um, get Statsu. Oh, DOS. I'm very bad at DOS, if you haven't noticed. <laughs> or at least, you know, command. I actually keep typing del tree, which is how you would have done that in DOS. friend's phone is really going at it with the dings. Whoa, BZ Flag uses SDL now? That is new. When I worked on BZ Flag, it did not use SDL. That's probably a good idea. can't find the compiler. So it could just be that I need to download some new Visual Studio component over again now that the Windows install has finished. So let's see if we can try that approach. I'm just gonna open Visual Studio and see if it'll let me make a Windows 8.1 SDK project. Oh, David is asking if this is an office. Um, yeah, no, this place is weird. It's, so when I say there's, it's my friend's phone, like this, like I, I'm leasing this place, but I also have friends that work here. And so they leave stuff here and it dings sometimes. Um, but this is basically my live work studio. Um, so I've got a loft up there where I live. And then down here I work on stuff. And it's just like one of the many ways in which you can find space around here. But this is the one that seemed to to show up and to be what I wanted to look for, so. Oh, okay, so Piot explains that the copyright holder is Tim Riker. Tim Riker was kind of the maintainer when I was kind of involved. And just to be clear, like, I, I wasn't really on the project. I was just kind of adjacent to the project. Um, I liked tinkering around with it, and I, like, I made tools that worked with it occasionally, but I didn't really, I don't think I ever committed to it. Uh, I was just friends with one of the maintainers. So I think the maintainer I'm thinking of is uh, David Trowbridge. And I think he was the one who was actively maintaining it a while with a couple other folks, while Tim Riker was sort of the maintainer on paper, but was already kind of checked out of it. Um, and yeah, Scott Wixer, I don't recognize that name. Uh, and yeah, Chris Soneman, uh I don't think we ever met. I think he was long gone by the time I showed up. Yeah. 
New project. Oh man, if I just had a big sheet of styrofoam and just like dripped E6000 onto it all over and it just made these little eyes and then put <laughs> like OLEDs behind them, <laughs> wouldn't that be weird? Oh yeah, I guess, I guess we ended up getting these uninstalled. I had this stuff installed before, but I guess the Windows update means that I need to reinstall these. Cool. Is that what this means? Okay, well this is simple. It just means I need to reinstall stuff. I don't know why I need to reinstall stuff, but I can do that. <laughs> Oh, inkjet printer, but with glue on styrofoam. Yeah. And then um, Danny the Mary asks, uh, during reverse engineering some IC in the past, did you ever find areas that were meant to confuse possible counterfeiting from some fraudulent manufacturer? That's interesting. Um, I mean, like, I don't really do IC reverse engineering. I'm not really equipped to do that here. I'll certainly cheer other people on and enjoy their photographs when they share them, but uh, that's not something I really have experience in. Um, if you're talking about people who decapsulate ICs specifically to clone them, I don't really know much about how that process or how you would go about confusing them. Um, the small number of counterfeit ICs I have seen folks post, um, they tend to... Wow, I just saw a bubble on the microscope pop and deflate in real time. Maybe I should be sharing that. Um, I shouldn't touch the desk. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I haven't done a lot of this stuff in person. The, some of the chips I have seen that are counterfeits, like counterfeit FTDI chips, they just don't look anything like the originals. They aren't trying to copy the mask, they're trying to copy the functionality. Um, I would be kind of surprised if it's practical to copy chips purely by copying the mask at the moment. Um, but I'm sure it depends on what process or what technology you have access to and what process technology the chip you're trying to copy is using. Um, so yeah, mostly I don't know the answer. It just seems like an interesting question, so I'd be interested to hear about that also. Um, there are certainly features that they put in, uh, like metal meshes that basically are just like randomized connections that you have to, uh, like you would have to kind of patch it back together around the hole that you're about to cut if you want to go through that, that uh, mesh. And so those protection meshes, you'll see those on like TPMs or other chips that are designed to be really tamper resistant. But that's usually, I think that's specifically for preventing someone from extracting data from the chip rather than protecting the chip's design. That's a good question too. Piotr asks, uh, they're curious whether the Game Boy CPU clones are a mask copy or just some other kind of like emulation or, or clone. That's really interesting. I would be curious about that too. Wow, this is super weird. You can kind of see these little fault lines in the liquid too, like where it might've had a viscosity change almost like little stretch marks. Ah, it's so cool. It seems like it might be entering a steady state, but we're gonna have to leave it alone and see. <laughs> oh yeah. Interesting, some ICs with the areas made specifically to confuse anyone reverse engineering it. Yeah, well, I, I guess reverse engineering might be different than copying though, because if you can get a clean image of all the layers, you don't really have to understand them. But uh, like, I don't know if that process is practical on any kind of modern process nodes, because like you would need to go all the way from kind of a, like a not so clean like photograph of the mask back to something that's higher resolution enough to, to actually manufacture from. And I don't know how you would verify that, right? Because like you don't have any of the verification test benches. Um, 
So yeah, maybe maybe it is only practical to use that for reverse engineering and then to go back to a new synthesizable design and then synthesize a new mask. So this is all conjecture. I would be really curious to see how it's actually done. Oh man, I have the option to connect to Azure, whatever that means. Um, wow, I just installed this kit, and now Windows is telling me I need to install it again. Did it fail somehow? Now it's like another setup is already running. is running. Oh, it just came up under some other window on a different monitor, so I didn't notice it. Cool. <laughs> Actually, those all sound useful, oddly enough. way of cutting up the development plugin landscape. Huh. Clang with Microsoft Code Gen. Weird. Weird. I've already got Git, thanks. Maybe if I use my external git, you won't uninstall it randomly. Hmm. Oh, let me reset chat, sorry. GB boy. Oh, don't worry about breaking the chat. It's totally not your fault. <laughs> oh man, I always wanted a system restore point. Maybe this is a good time to make a cup of coffee. <laughs> Tuco's enjoying that spot though. All right, I'll be right back. I'm going to recaffeinate. Maybe I'll fill this mug. <laughs>
Is it still installing? Oh, geez, it's still installing. Maybe I need to eat pizza. <sighs> okay. Didn't realize this was going to be installation con 2017. We've got a scary ghost in the YouTube chat. Hmm. Famiclone style chips. I think I'm a little behind in the chat. Maybe we need to pull this out. GB boy. Yeah, I've been curious to get one of these. They seem interesting. I seem to remember there was some glitch in the emulation, which was kind of un unfortunate. I don't remember what that was, though. Famiclone. Is this like a Nintendo on chip kind of thing, or is this? I'm losing track of which mini Nintendo we're talking about, because like the, the small one I've got, the NES Classic, that has just an ARM and a Linux emulator, but. NES on a chip, neat. Yeah, that would be fun. Why do we have all these tools to install? All right. Pardon me, I'm going to eat cold pizza in front of you. Mmm. Oh, okay. So Microhex is talking about clones that also take regular cartridges. That's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. This machine has a spinning disc, which is probably the uh, bottleneck in a lot of what it's doing. I should probably upgrade that. Yeah, this is a big slice. They, I forget what the size is. This is a pizza place around here. They only have one size, so I don't know how many inches it is. And then each pizza is like nine pieces the size. They're really good. Um, yeah, this one's like mushroom and a bunch of other tasty stuff, but mo mostly mushroom. <laughs> yeah, this place is great. They're called Rotten City Pizza. I think Rotten City is one of the nicknames that Emeryville had. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty nice. And yeah, they sell pizza by the slice. You can just buy one of these and have it for dinner. <laughs> oh yeah, you, you don't buy one of these whole pizzas and then eat it yourself. That's not how these work. You get a slice or a couple slices for yourself or you get the whole pizza and share it with some friends. But yeah, a lot of American food is super weird. I, I can't stand how sugary a lot of the stuff is here. Um, like, I don't, I don't, I think, I think my diet has diverged significantly from mainstream American food since I was little. 
but anytime I do find myself in like oh there's a little video glitch right there isn't there hello are we still streaming yeah see this is great installing stuff on the streaming machine oh yeah man the corn subsidies that is probably a huge problem here Oh, yeah, baked beans. Man, I like the idea of baked beans, but I, I got a can of baked beans at the grocery store recently, and I still have not opened it because I, I was like, I realized after I got it just how much sugar there is in there. And it's like, oh man, if, I'm, if I eat this, it's gonna be really sweet unless I find something else to put it in that really needs, that like balances that out somehow. I don't know. But, I went to Denny's for breakfast, which is like a very American, very chain kind of diner place. Um, and there was one of those near the hotel, or the hotel I was staying at. So I, I got breakfast at Denny's um, yesterday. And so I had hash browns and grits and, um, and scrambled eggs. It was great. But I feel like I had to really work on the menu to find something that wasn't sweet or made of meat. Finding the non-sweet vegetarian stuff was hard but I think that worked out. Oh yeah, baked beans and cornbread. That'd be, that's, that's a good way to do it. Yeah, my parents are both kind of from Louisiana. I mean, yeah, that, that's where they grew up. They grew up in Louisiana and we all moved to Colorado when I was pretty young. Um, well, I was born in Texas but they were mostly from Louisiana. Then they were working in Texas when I was born. I don't remember much about Texas. And then I mostly grew up in Colorado. So there was a lot of like kind of Southern food, but not really like kind of half-hearted Southern food. Cause like my parents didn't really care that much about food for the most part. And, um, but their traditions were mostly this like Southern stuff. It was kind of a weird, weird way to grow up. Hmm. American bread. I think it depends on what kind of bread you get. Like if you buy like a loaf of Wonder Bread or like whatever is like the popular stuff at the supermarket, a lot of that stuff is really sweet, but you can find a lot of much better bread here. Are you seeing the video glitching that I'm seeing? This is definitely uh, living on the edge here. Installing on the computer while I'm streaming from it. Hmm. Yeah, this comment, the cheap stuff is sweet. You can say that about most food in the US, which is really disgusting. Like it's, I hate that that's how it ended up. Hmm. Oh, nice. I like I like the way Nick describes his food background. My parents are not even slightly vegetarian. They think being vegetarian is super weird. Hmm. <laughs> oh, biscuits. Hmm. <laughs> Yeah, I've tried doing biscuits a couple times. Cuz like my family does not have a strong like cooking tradition really. So um my mom did biscuits sometimes, but mostly they were from a can. And so they tasted like any other time you would make the same biscuits from the same can. Um I tried making biscuits from a recipe that I got from my grandmother. I'm not close with my grandmother. I don't like her. I don't really want to see her, but she gave me a biscuit recipe a while ago and I, I still have not been able to make it work. I'm bad at it, very bad at it. Mm. This is 
does acquiring mean it's downloading it here? Or what are we really doing here? This receive is going to be a combination of whatever this thing is doing and the uh, all the camera sources in OBS. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Willie on YouTube chat says that I'm the queen of the pizza. <laughs> Thanks. I'm glad everybody is enjoying watching me eat pizza while my computer struggles to install Visual, St Visual Studio components. You were talking about cookies, not those kinds of biscuits. Okay, sorry. I was getting confused. I don't know why it's decided to randomly put a line here at 200 megabits. So both of these are magnetic disks. Um, these aren't the same magnetic disk, are they? No. They have different model numbers, which is good. But uh, this one is the main system disk. This is a weird motherboard that has some kind of um, some kind of flash memory cache module. But I don't think it's very good. I think we'd be better off having an actual SSD and an actual spinning disk rather than a spinning disk with some kind of weird motherboard cache module. Oh, biscuit. Mm-hmm. Does it taste like bourbon? <laughs> Oh yeah, I totally need Windows 10 mobile emulators. I guess I forgot to turn that off. <laughs> yeah, we are spinning some rust here. Why does that say USB drive here? Ah, that's a USB flash reader that doesn't have a card in it. I forget why I ended up putting this at um, C colon slash recording instead of D colon. For some reason, a junction mount or whatever that's called in Windows seemed like a better idea. Speaking of watching paint and or glue dry. Oh, you have to explain the different meanings of bourbon. <laughs> this seems like it might be dry. I think I kind of want to poke it. Do you want me to poke it? Do you want me to leave it alone? I can bend it a little and it distorts. Oh, 
oh man, that would be fun. Like use this as a way to form like a thin kind of lens membrane between a stationary platform and a platform that's got a piezo actuator under it. Ah, that is quite cool. I want to try poking the bubbles at least. I feel like I've got to get this on video, though. Um, I mean, I know I'm streaming this, but I mean, with the actual microscope recorder, uh, I don't think I can start that from where I'm sitting, so I'll be right back. Actually, I can start it from over here, and that's probably the easiest way to do it. Need that, and... That. You don't need to watch me sign in. Let's go back to this. There we go. This is the slightly higher quality recording device. Let's hope it's putting it on the right disc. D colon. Of course it's D colon on this machine. I just am not sure I actually have this pointed to the right directory. Ah geez, yeah, user mic of videos is not gonna have enough space for this. See, I know I've set this up before. It's just probably some software upgrade didn't actually copy over the configuration. I can't actually paste? Why can't I paste? You know, maybe I wasn't actually using this program. I've got this set up in a couple different ways. Um, and actually, maybe I was using OBS on this machine to do the deinterlacing in real, oh, that's right. Because if I record this with the Elgato software, um, they do the deinterlacing in a post-processing step, which is super annoying. 
Um, so actually, I'd been setting it up to record through OBS, doing the deinterlacing in real time. Yes, here I am reverse engineering my own setup because I can't remember things. D colon slash recording, good. Okay, and then we can stop and just check this really quick. Okay. <laughs> All right, thanks for bearing with me. I am going to poke this. It's very plasticky, very thick on the surface. Can we get closer? Pretty strong. You can see I'm leaving little indentations in it, damaging it, but I'm not just immediately tearing through it. Wow, I don't think that actually punctured. If I put a bead of water, will it actually make it through or will it stay on the surface? Oops. <laughs> my water bottle was starting to spray without my intention. That's great. <laughs> and it's still watertight. This one feels like it hasn't dried quite as thoroughly. It's a little wet. Can I actually puncture this? <laughs> I might need a different tool. Wow. Okay, what about a toothpick? Oh, good question. Mr. Fisk asks which Servo AF t-shirt I'm wearing. I think it's L. Um, I'm not actually wearing it right now. Um, be right back.
two shirts here. Yeah, so the Servo AF shirt I have here is, it's just L. I, I don't think there were gendered sizes. I think this is just the L. Um, and it's like comfortably big on me. It's not like the kind of shirt if I wanted to be like super slim and like showing off my body shape and whatever. But if I just want something that's comfortable, this is a good size for me at least. And then I also wanted to show off this shirt, which this was a gift from Kate Temkin. She gave me this uh, Colorado Hardware Hacker shirt, which is also pretty awesome. It's the Colorado flag and the open source hardware gear kind of merged together. So I've been happy with that too. Man, I'm kind of almost ashamed to be poking at this without like weird colored lights behind it or something. Okay, so here's a toothpick. The toothpick will of course absorb a little bit of the water. It still doesn't feel like it's punctured. Can I show you the other side of this? <laughs> oh, maybe that did puncture. Nope, it's still coated with glue. <laughs> Hi, little pointy thing. You are coated with glue. That is so weird. This is gonna definitely get my video flagged by the automatic porn filter. There we go, finally punctured. And of course, now it'll just slide through that hole if I wanted it to. Mmm, look at those little furry bits on the toothpick. It's like serrated now. Okay. That's a lot more fun than I expected to have with a drop of E6000, a scrap of styrofoam, and a toothpick. So, yeah, I highly recommend that if you have a well-ventilated area to experiment in. <laughs> All right, anyway, back to seeing if the Windows machine is done installing. <laughs> Is it still installing? <laughs> All right. Did we find out what the bourbon in here means? I just have to look this up. So they're chocolate. Okay. <laughs> I learned something today. Is it like an Oreo? It looks better than an Oreo. Hmm. 
Hmm. That could be delicious. Oh man, spinning rust. Now I'm like, how expensive are SSDs these days? Because maybe I need another SSD in my life. No, I just want, I just want like a catalog. Oh man, see that would be nice having a PCI SSD, but I am constrained by the number of slots on this motherboard. So I really just need a SATA device. And I guess two and a half inch is the only option there. So and how much do I actually need? I mean, I'm only using a few hundred gigs right now, but I probably could cut that down. Anyway, let's just see what the prices are like. Two hundred and forty gig Kingston for under a hundred bucks. It's so nice how much these keep coming down. That might be a thing I do soon. Blum blum blum. MD merge, huh? Wonder what that does. Do I want to know why it's doing this at install time? <laughs> hmm. Well, was. Okay. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, it is nice that SSDs are getting so cheap. Nick Poole says they have a 120 gig, two and a half inch drive on a USB-C cable that you can just use to like copy files around like a jump drive. That's pretty great. Oh man, and Vince asks, who remembers installing Windows NT? Do you cry after the 10th reboot? <laughs> Remember when every app install required a reboot? Yeah, I mean, I'm glad things got a lot better on Windows since then. It's still annoying when you need to reboot, but it's nice that that happens more like monthly instead of <laughs> more often now. Oh, nice. Whisperfist has Scanlime swag on the way. Well, congratulations and thank you. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I like the shirts. I've been I've been needing to upload some higher resolution artwork for the stickers because I'm a little unhappy with the res, but otherwise everything's been great. Like I like Redbubble's printing quality. The die cuts seem, I mean, maybe it's not a die cut, but whatever process they use for cutting out the edges of the stickers also seems really nice. So I've been happy with that. We've reached the configuring your system stage. This isn't gonna make me reboot right after I install, is it? It's at least gonna let me compile some things and then randomly make me reboot later, right? I just wanna compile things, man. If you, uh, actually, so one other thing that came up um, in the last stream or two that we were thinking of is maybe some way of having a real-time share of the code that I've been editing here. Um, right now it's all on GitHub, which is of course not real-time, but it would be cool to have something where maybe we could like share a local directory and then all the changes show up in real-time, um, or at least like every time I save the file on, on some website with server push. Yeah, Dean says they probably just have a continuous printer and vinyl cutter for all the orders they have to deal with. That makes sense to me. It looks it looks like they would just have like a robotic knife cutting out every sticker. So this is the plugin. This is what we're interested in developing. This is OBS itself, which is just what we need to get compiling first, which isn't actually that hard to compile 
when you actually have Visual C installed correctly, which has been the problem today and on the last stream. <laughs> I had it installed, and then something happened to cause it to partially uninstall. I assume it was update related. This might take a while, unlike all the other steps you've been going through, thanks. It's not like you need a progress bar. So yeah, there isn't a ton of code in here so far. It's been a lot of scaffolding and setting up dependencies. Um, the main code we've got here is really in this bot connector class, which is intended to be a way to uh, to get like a real-time data pipe going between the OBS plugin and the Rust process that's actually running the main control loops in the bot and doing everything else really. Oh, that's great. Redbubble delivers to Australia in like five days, which is still not fast, but way better than the alternatives, it looks like. <coughs> oh, I just noticed a couple of comments I was missing in YouTube chat, sorry. Um, uh, Gitir, I think, says Delta Airlines biscuits are the best. <laughs> I've actually got some all right biscuits or cookies on, on flights. It's nice when that works out. Um, and then MakeOMK says, I think OBS is pretty good deinterlacing these days, too. Yeah, I agree. I've, that, that whole thing that apparently I've set up ages ago and then partially forgot about where I can deinterlace the microscope in real time with OBS has been working out really well, because I just take those files and drop them directly into video editing when I'm ready for that, and that works out quite nicely. But, uh, how big of an SSD would I want for this machine? Do I have Windurst out on here? I don't, but I probably should. Oh man, are you ready for this? We're gonna agree to the GPL. <laughs> uh, I have ranted about that before because it's not how you use the GPL. The GPL does not cover using software, it covers distributing software. So having it in the click-through pane in the installer is just not, it just doesn't mean anything. This is going to make the installer run fast, right? <laughs> Look at all the little Pac-Men. I mean, the Winder stat is probably superfluous. I probably just mostly want all the files that are already on here. Three twenty gig seems a little large for what the system actually needs, but maybe that's because we're doing development on it right now. I didn't really intend this machine to be for development.
Wow. That's pretty cool. Half a terabyte SSDs. Man. Somewhere around here, I've got a picture of the first terabyte I ever had to my name. And it was a full tower PC stuffed full of disks. It was like something my college roommates and I were pretty proud of at the time because we used it to store all of our music. We just like put all of our music in the same place and we could all access it. <laughs> Hal says having the GPL in the EULA is a form of advertisement, I guess. You don't usually think of ads as something you have to agree to. All right, I might, I might pick one of these to order because that would speed up this machine substantially and wouldn't be that expensive. Yeah, I guess I don't really need this. Hmm. Yeah, that's nice. Dean mentions that the NVMe drives are a lot faster. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, that would be nice. But doing that on this machine would require upgrading the motherboard also, which doesn't seem worth it. Because I, I have three slots in this machine. One for the GPU and two video capture cards. <laughs> So there are a lot of 480 gig and 500 gig drives. That's pretty cool. Hmm. Oh man, I don't really care that much about like totally optimizing the speed. I think like at this time, at this point, I would mostly be looking for indications of reliability. But then, like this, this computer is not going to be like it's not going to have the only copy of pretty much anything that's actually on it. It's like most of the machines I have around here, if their main hard drive died. It would take some time to reinstall everything, but I wouldn't actually lose any data. And then the machines that I actually do a lot of new work on, I just have backups on those. Damn, this Patriot one that's on sale might actually be pretty good. flash I didn't intend this to be the storage shopping stream but you know got to work with what you've got Oh nice thread ripper and the customers always also bought I didn't see that that's cool Does Amazon, why does Amazon have three star reviews for this? Why is my browser for Amazon so big? It's 
So we have a couple of DOAs, somebody who fucked up a firmware update. Yeah, whatever. Uh-huh. Yeah, whatever. You've got to figure that some of these actually are defective, but then some people just don't know how to install them. And then some of these are probably actually just early failures. But for this machine, that's probably fine. Hmm. Still configuring the system. <laughs> Michael Lieben now on YouTube chat says, go old school, disc on chip. <laughs> yeah, I used to be really into those. Like I never actually had one, but I would see them in magazines and think, oh, they're so cool. They put a disc on a 40 pin dip. Can we find any data sheets for those? Cause those are pretty neat. Whoa. Wow, I didn't realize they got so big. One gigabyte. <laughs> They've got some FFS technology. <laughs> I think it's really funny when, when people just make up acronyms and then try to introduce them like they mean something. And then of course, there's like five other things that it already means, which everybody's gonna think of instead. Yeah. Oh, we're leveling. I had kind of a weird opportunity to do a bunch of my own flash translation stuff when I worked at Siftio. Because we had some pretty weird requirements for the operating system. And I needed to have the, an ability to store both big static chunks of data that had very simple mappings and where I could grab a whole page there and drop it in one page in RAM and not have to like slice and dice the pages and reassemble them. And that was what we wanted for just streaming read-only content. But for stuff that changed a lot, we wanted wear leveling on that, of course, and journaling. And then for updating the games, we wanted kind of a coarse degree of wear leveling that would happen outside those blocks. So it was a pretty weird system. It was basically like this one, um, very coarse grained file allocation system that knew how to it knew how to allocate and map like 128 kilobyte blocks of the flash um, and then within those blocks things were linearly mapped so you didn't have to maintain mostly it was we didn't want to we didn't want to reserve all the ram that would be required for a cache of a full a fully associative mapping table so we wanted to be able to have the bulk of the game's mapping be linear but to still have wear leveling and still have journaling for all the small bits of data we were writing to Flash. So then inside those larger volumes, we had a smaller journaling system that could take up, you know, bit like it would grab one of those 128K chunks and then inside there, it would fill it up with a, a repeating journal. Um, and then you could actually take a bunch of those and chain them together so that basically you'd have a bunch of static stuff in Flash that would not be wear leveled except when you reinstalled an application. But then around all that static stuff, you'd be wear leveling within all the free space. So that was kind of interesting. Limit 20 per customer, all right, that's fine. <laughs> of course, the problem with just like buying this on stream is that then you'll all see like my address and what kind of credit card I have and stuff that I don't actually need to share with all of you. <laughs> uh, 
Oh man, well I could just end this since, man, who knows how much longer this is gonna take. But as soon as this is done, we might actually be able to get some work done. Ugh. Oh, Mako MK says, I think some of the cheaper Android tablets are using software FTL. No, software FTL is actually super common. I mean, Linux does that on a lot of embedded devices. That's what the whole MTD layer is for. Um, the reason this was especially weird with Siftio was just because we needed a particular, we, we just had a bunch of weird constraints for this file system. Like, fat wouldn't have worked, you know, none of the other file systems would have worked because we just needed to, it was pretty much all the RAM requirement, basically. Like, we, we couldn't just cache these huge data structures. We had to design the file system so that you could parse everything with very little RAM. Oh, that's interesting. So apparently, uh, regarding the GB Boy Silicon, Fertex says that it uh, doesn't exactly match the logic of a real Game Boy. So they probably didn't just copy the mask. Or maybe if they did, they made some mistakes and then tried to fix them, who knows. Oh no. Pretty soon web ad JavaScript will be mining coins on your disk controller. That's scary. I mean, they might as well do it on WebGL, right? I mean, if you're interested in mining Bitcoins on random ARM microcontrollers scattered around your computer, you could probably do that in a lot of places. It would just be really, really slow. Because, um, bit, I mean, Bitcoin doesn't need much RAM, right? You're just iterating initialization vectors and doing hashes, right? Um, what was the one that was meant to be really RAM constrained? Is that Litecoin? That one would be harder. But if you're just doing hashes, like, in fact, a lot of microcontrollers have a little bit of hash acceleration. It may or may not be useful for Bitcoin. Um, I mean, it's certainly not usefully fast. I'm just, like, it may or may not be usable at all. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, you've already, you already see, like, malicious websites mining coins in the background. <laughs> I mean, you've got plenty of CPU and memory on a web page because people expect the web page to just guzzle down resources these days. Oh, okay, Ethereum is RAM bandwidth constrained, which is interesting. Is there any that's RAM amount constrained? Because that seems like something that would be more effective at fighting ASIC mining. I mean, RAM bandwidth is something where you'd be pressured to speed up your whole ASIC process, which is expensive, but doesn't really have fundamental limitations, whereas RAM size, you just end up forcing people to have larger silicon area per miner. At least that's what I would assume, knowing very little about actually how this stuff works. Oh, it requires more RAM as Ethereum is made more difficult. Interesting. Wow, three and a half gigs of VRAM. Cool, so yeah, definitely not something a microcontroller could touch. Unless you had swap space. <laughs> If your keyboard microcontroller starts using your SSD as swap space, you better watch out. You might be able to mine the slowest Ethereum. <laughs> this is not exciting. I feel like we're watching paint dry, except we just watched glue dry, and the watching glue dry was actually really cool. So... Let's maybe give this a deadline. I'm gonna give this a couple more minutes. If we're just waiting for it without anything better to do, then I'm gonna end the stream, because this is dumb. But if it finishes, or if we think of something else to do, then we could do that. It is still installing. I'm glad we're having a nice chat, though. And yeah, I mean, it's nice to decompress post B-sides. Um. <laughs> well, 
Well, cool. Piotr says that I don't mind the computer constrained stream. Well, that's cool. <laughs> Yeah, B-Sides was nice. You know, the conferency parts were difficult, but I had some good times with people. I have a really hard time with people in general, but I, like, once you kind of get through the, the, like, what is this context anyway, and how do I, do I know anybody here? Do I know anybody, period? <laughs> I think it also helps that I've just, um, I think I've been just expecting less from all that. It's, it's like, yeah, I know I don't have to, I don't have to interact with people in the same way other people interact with. I can just try to find stuff that works out for me. I don't have to be the social butterfly. I probably shouldn't be the social butterfly. I probably don't want to be the social butterfly. Oh, haha. <laughs> um, good question from Ananexis asking, when do I plan on adopting a few more cats? Um, no, we're not, not anytime soon, no. Um, yeah, no, I was fostering two cats who did finally make it to their real home in LA. And so that's nice. I'm happy for them. I, uh, I'm just happy it's Tuco and I at the moment. Like, I'm glad I could help the cats out. I might do something like that again in the future if I, I mean, I wouldn't do exactly the same thing again for sure. Um, I might do something similar that has maybe slightly different circumstances in the future. But right now I'm happy with it just being Tuco and I. And yeah, the other, the other two cats are at their real home in LA. They got a really interesting custom flight there on a tiny experiment aircraft. It was pretty great. Oh, wow. And it wants me to restart. Ah. Why does it want me to restart? Can, okay, I'm gonna ignore it. I'm gonna try using it anyway. Now we're waiting on something completely different. OBS is using relatively little CPU though. Wonder why that's the case. Okay, so I think the thing I was gonna do first is just see if I can make a Windows 8.1 SDK project and then try CMake and see if CMake can see all the stuff we need. <laughs> Vince says, hopefully it doesn't start uninstalling without a restart. Yeah, that would be mean. And an Nexus says, now we wait for the 37 gigabytes of patch data to download. Yeah, what is this, Xbox? Look at all the kinds of apps we have, wow. Let's try making, what does it mean by universal app? Does that mean 64-bit or does that mean interpreted code or something? Uh, let's look that up. I think this is something I don't want. Yeah, I, no. What are you building? 
Is this like LLVM bitcode or something? Is this a new kind of VM? Is it x86? Tell me the actual details. You haven't told me anything about this. Yeah. Well, so this is for stuff that already starts out in CLR. And it seems like it's designed to support something that you compile C++ to. Oh yeah, the actual info, go to Wikipedia, that's a good idea. Platform homogeneous sounds ominous. We just stir all the platforms until they're evenly consistent. There's a weird bit of sunlight coming through here, isn't there? Oh, those holes are in the stand that the laptop over there is sitting on, and now I'm using it as a sunlight mask. Windows runtime. Oh, WinRT. Okay. I know this as WinRT. That makes more sense. WR. Oh no. What? No. Okay, so they're compiling C into a CLR binary? with some extensions to make native com kind of work. Wow. I'm glad I'm not working on anything that has to run on this. That looks like a pain. Why are all of these universal apps? There we go. I'm just gonna see if I can build this. DirectX app, Windows 8.1 API. No XAML, no WinRT, just Windows API, native app. So far it hasn't crashed or demanded that I download 40 gigs of updates. <laughs> and Nexus says, man, I hope you don't step into, into any of that platform homogeneous. It takes forever to wash off. <laughs> yeah, sounds about right. Can I build? Why is it building 32-bit? These defaults are bad. I want 64-bit native code. I don't want virtual machine code. I don't want 32-bit code. Good sign so far. It's linking. Oh, it's installing some stuff. Installing the Visual C libraries for 64-bit, which seems like something I would be wanting. And now it's running on the other monitor. And it's moving by itself. Cool. Thank you. The window moved as soon as the texture loaded, or whatever this is. I mean, there isn't a texture, but it was displaying that X before. <laughs> Where is this resize behavior even coming from? See, now it's constrained by the vertical size or by the horizontal. No, because if you touch the horizontal limit, it just shrinks way smaller. So it's like a quantized horizontal limit plus a vertical limit? I don't see how that's a good idea. Is the code for that in the sample? Like, why would that even exist the way they're doing it? 
Speaking of this platform having weird defaults, create window size dependent resources. Sure. Where are the other files? Different files. Solution Explorer. Where's the scene? I've got app and main. Oh, under content. Sample 3D scene renderer. Cool. Oh, they're just doing this as a demonstration, I guess. That's a weird example, folks. I guess they just wanted a change that was obvious so that you could see it in the source code and then see the effect it has. Hmm. Okay, I'm gonna stop trying to get inside Microsoft's head because I don't really wanna be there. And let's just see if CMake will make any progress. <laughs> and Nexus says, I vote you make it a lime. Cubes are so mid-90s. Yeah. If I wanted to spend more time hacking on that, maybe. Um, Vince says, manage C++. No, that thing that I just built was a native binary. The manage C++ would have been that WinRT universal app stuff, which a lot of the demos wanted to use, but I was avoiding because that's not what I'm trying to build right now. Um, anyway, I think let's just go back into the CMake GUI. Oh, I didn't notice the, the carrots and stuff. You sure that isn't just like C++11? I guess we can go back into that really quick. This has a .cpp extension. So far, this looks like C++. What are we talking about here? That doesn't look like C++. This is DirectX. I mean, I don't know what this namespace is. Is this something new for DirectX, or is this somebody's DirectX wrapper? Helper.h. Oh, here it is. Yeah, that's this wrapper right here. Yeah, where does that come from, this API? I think that might just be some new user mode API Microsoft has, but let's find out. This is the library they're using. I don't know that this means it's managed C++ code. I think this might just be a library that's designed to have the same API, whether it's managed or not managed. 
I mean, we should be able to open up the binary and see just x86-64 code sitting there. So maybe we should just do that. Um, Where's my exe file? <sighs> Why are these? Paths cut off. Okay, x64 debug app1. Then we have app1.exe. Wow. This is not what I want. And uh, man, so this is some managed code stuff. What does that actually exe file look like in WinDebug? This is just all out of curiosity. None of this is relevant to what we're actually doing. <laughs> This is just parts of the Windows collection of APIs that I haven't had any reason to get into lately. Did that not open? <sighs> Can I copy paste this? Yeah, same Win32 error. Interesting. So where did that build target actually come from? It says debug x64. There were also two exes that came out in that search. I'm wondering if maybe there was, there was also an, like something else left over that wasn't the one that I just compiled. Hmm. It's using 2013. Why is this opt-in? Uh, and why is this happening on a Windows 8 app? What? That's not even... No, none of that. Yeah, so this, this Windows namespace stuff is interesting. I think that's the C++ CX stuff, which is really strange. The DirectX usage looks absolutely normal here, though. Anyway, I want to try CMake. I, I think I want to get back to this world where I'm building a regular Win32 app. Let's see if this works. Well, Len is suggesting I make a Win30C, Win32 or MFC app project. I made a project that was a that looked like a native DirectX app. That's, and I, I know I could make a different kind of project. I was just stuck on like, why is this what I'm getting out of that process? Okay, cool. That went that got farther. So it found the compiler, but it needs a couple of additional directories here which we're now back on the normal OBS build process script. So like, 
I'm just doing this from memory, but this is also stuff that's in the OBS wiki now. So I downloaded these files and stuck them in my root. And then I think it wants Win64 directory. Similar with Qt. Wants a version and a compiler. And then we don't want captions or installer or Unix style pet paths. Yay. This is making progress. So Michael Liebno is suggesting I don't use Visual Studio and I use Windows platform tools. And I know there's a bunch of ways to do this. The reason I'm using this particular version of Visual Studio is that this is the recommended build process for OBS Studio, which is the project I'm building. So, and now I think I lost video. Did that just cut out for everyone? Anyway, yeah, I, I, what I was trying to say when it cut out is I, I'm not doing this because it's like the preferred way of doing it for a brand new Windows project. It's the way that this particular Windows project is doing it. Okay, so it finished the configuration cycle. All the stuff that's red is red because it's changed, not because it's bad. Um, we have an opportunity to look through this again, but it's probably already set up correctly. So I'm just gonna scan it really quick. I think this is fine. We could, for example, build this without the UI. We could bu enable building the browser plugin, which is pretty nice, but we don't need that right now. Uh, my plugin should be set up to build by default, so I think we just need to generate, then open the project and see if it works. This warning is something about the Qt integration, I think. This is related to an area of the code base we're nowhere near, so I'm gonna ignore that for now. Visual Z is still kind of getting its stuff together here, but it's it's working on it. Parsing. So much parsing. Ooh, parsing. No more coffee. If they put this on a progress bar, it would just like keep going back and forth because it keeps finding new files also. <laughs> Excuse me. <coughs> <coughs> yeah, this computer does seem to be pretty storage limited. both the same file, the same date stamp, and I can't see the path. App X. I don't know why that subdirectory exists. Debug build x64, those are both what we want. Let's just try this. <laughs> I 
<laughs> Welcome to the parsing games. Yeah. <laughs> Michael says, yeah, but now your code will run on PC, Xbox One, and Windows Mobile. Yeah, except I don't think OBS will run on all those platforms just by compiling it under that other kit. This is, I am in the land of extremely platform specific stuff and something that, like just picking a different kind of project is not going to change that. Oh, that's interesting. Dean's current tablet is a quad-core Atom that might actually be able to run Linux. That could be fun. I've got a little Windows Surface PC over here that I'm using for stream chat and stuff. And it's probably in a similar situation where I could probably put a different OS on it, but right now it's, it's fine running Windows. <laughs> it just needs to run a couple of web browsers and it can handle that just fine. Oh, what are we doing? So we're compiling some UI stuff. The UI might be the slowest part of this to compile, which is pretty common. That was my last piece of pizza. It's okay. I love the pizza went to a good home. Oh, yeah. Dean says Intel kind of canned any of their new low-power Atom chips, so the these might be the only cheap ones for a while. Yeah, that's unfortunate. Oh, we got some failures. Cool. Cool, cool. Um, are we missing the debug versions of the Windows? Or the Visual C runtime library. <sighs> Import invalid parameter. What? <laughs> what? 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 Okay, fine. This is a new problem. Apparently, we have multiple conflicting versions of the debug Visual C runtime. Uh, I'm just going to try compiling a release build and see if that, or release with debug info actually. I've had problems with this debug build before. I have also got it working, so I know the problems aren't, um, like some of the problems might just be like random things that are wrong with this machine setup rather than like the whole code base just does not work in debug mode. But let's try release with debug symbols because that's actually usually what I want to build anyway. <laughs> Only 26 projects failed. Close enough. I'm going for pizza. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I could walk down the street and get some more pizza. I probably don't need to get a pizza from that same place two days in a row. But I mean, I am back in town. That's... <laughs> There's some good food in Portland. Um, with uh, Pewter, we ended up going to get some really delicious vegetarian sushi. I, I didn't have a, the hugest appetite, so I only had one roll, but it was a really good roll. It was tempura jalapeno and cream cheese, which of course is not anything like traditional sushi, nor is that the idea, but it's just like a delicious thing that you can put in your face, which has a similar form factor to sushi. A lot of sushi restaurants have veggie options, but they tend to kind of, I don't know, like you, you get in a rut pretty easily. It's like, oh, I'll have the one with carrot and I'll have the one with some uh, yamagobo and like uh, avocado or something. And so like you'll, you'll usually find places that have a handful of rolls that have like a couple of good vegetables in them. But it's nice, it's nice finding a sushi restaurant that like actually has really tasty veggie rolls. Oh yeah, yeah, Peter and I um, 
we also all had a, a good time uh, watching the fishes in the tank. We were sitting next to a fish tank. Oh yeah, hummus is pretty much always something I'm interested in. <laughs> there was there was some hummus, like there there were a couple of little catered snack things that the conference did, and one of those was hummus based, and I was super into that. Yay, we have different errors. This looks like it's just not linking in Windows.dll or something. No, but these are include files. Why are we building OBS VST anyway? Oops, I didn't actually want to sort by identifier, thanks. Why? <laughs> uh, where are we and how do we get out of this hell? I don't even want to compile this plugin. get this path wrong, did I? There's always the question of like, oh, was I really supposed to pick like the include directory instead of just slash win64? I should actually check the wiki. Or maybe it wasn't the wiki, maybe it was just somewhere in the documentation, but. This looks like a wiki. Windows building from source. Well, I guess it works with 2017. I thought we were on 2015 here. Something else I thought was only gonna work with 2015, like one of the computer vision libraries. I don't know, maybe we could actually go up to 2017 here. I could be... Oh, 2017 is ABI compatible. I don't remember seeing this. I wonder if this is new or if I just didn't notice it last time. Oh, I did need slash include in the depths path. Okay, that was a mistake. Let's fix that. I think I can just hit generate again and then Visual C will reload the project when I switch back there. Oh yeah, maybe a reboot is required. I mean, it's possible. I don't think we've quite gotten to that point yet, but we might. <laughs> Having the wrong include path would definitely explain that problem though. Something inside all of that failed. Great. Um, this is copying a DLL from one place to the other. I don't know if this actually reloaded the project file correctly. Let's just do that. Let's clean this. Close it. Generate and open it and see if that makes a difference. Yeah, I mean, maybe this does require a reboot, in which case I'll just have to end the stream, and that's fine. But anyway, I mean, now that I'm done with the talk prep and all the associated stress, um, I should be able to just concentrate on these projects for the near future, so 
Um, I should be streaming this stuff pretty frequently. Yeah. Yeah, no, it is very common for some installations to happen right after the reboot. Um, it just seemed like it was worth a try. Because what's common in Windows installers is for you to have this primitive that's like, if nobody's using this DLL, install it now. Otherwise, just remember to install it at the next reboot. And they, like, because that is one of the primitives that a bunch of the other install operations are built on, you can easily end up in this state where you may need a reboot, and it's kind of hard for those higher level components to tell you what will actually work and what won't. That said, the error I just had looked a lot like the include path was just wrong. So let's keep, keep at this for a sec. I could make more coffee or I could pet the cat. Both good options. Now we have 800 errors. Cool. And it still can't find a bunch of Windows library symbols. OK. Maybe the next step is to try the reboot. So This is a strange place for it to be failing, but because I think these commands actually run after the build to just copy the binaries into the right place. So I'm not confident that this problem is related at all to the install reboot that it asked us to do, but oh well. I think I'll try the reboot, and then I'll get back to this and do some more debugging. And I might feel like streaming some more of that later. Anyway, for now, I think we can do some two head rubs.
Tiku is making some great noises. Job, Tico. Oh man, it's so nice to be back and playing with Tuco. I hope everyone has a good day and sorry the cat is a little bit out of focus. This will all be easier once I have a robot helping me out. <laughs> like that one. All right, well, I think I'm wrapping up the stream for now, but um, I will see everyone shortly. It's, uh, I've got a lot more headspace for this project now, so I should be able to actually spend um, some more time on this instead of just stressing out about what I'm going to say in a week, so looking forward to that. <laughs> oh yeah, Alex says it looked like Tuco was trying to pick it up with his thumbs. Yeah, he does that a lot. He gets a lot of use out of those thumbs with the bolts. <laughs> Anyway, thanks for, uh, thanks for hanging out. Um, I will see everyone on the next stream. And as always, thanks to everyone who ha helps out the streams with their monthly Patreon contributions or by just hanging out or by telling your friends about the stream. It's all super helpful. And Tuco and I both appreciate it. So happy hacking, folks. I'll see you all next time.